Hello, welcome, and thanks for joining me. Let's spend a few minutes chatting about The Doomed City by Boris and Arkady Strugatsky, The Strugatsky Brothers, which is a book that I recently finished reading. And this book was uh, published by the Chicago Review Press back in 2016. It was originally published in Russia, Soviet Russia, back in 1989. Um, this, trend, this edition that I read was translated by Andrew Bromfield and had a foreword by Dmitry Glukovsky and an afterword by Boris Strugatsky himself. So yeah, this is the fifth of the Strugatsky uh, brothers novels that I've read. I've read, um, earlier I read Roadside Picnic, I've read Hard to Be a God, I've read uh, Definitely Maybe, and The Snail on the Slope, and I have chatted all four of those novels, and I will link to the links to the chats for those below for anyone who's interested and didn't catch those earlier. But yeah, The Doomed City by Boris and Arkady Strugatsky. Um, originally published back in 1989, however, it was written in 1972 because this was the Soviet era. And this particular novel, um, if you read up on it a bit, almost everyone frames it in terms of a satire or a social commentary of the Soviet system of that time. And so even though the book was written in 1972, it was considered, um, you know, not publishable at the time and actually quite dangerous. It was actually hidden uh, for many years from about 1972, I guess, when it was finished up until the late 80s when the Soviet system sort of started to relax a bit and it was published, like I mentioned, in 19. 89. So yeah, the book, I don't want to give a lot away. This book was of the, of the four pre, of the, this is the fifth now of the Strugatsky novels that I've read. I think I might have enjoyed this one the most. And I, I don't want to give anything away that would maybe detract from reading. So I'm going to be really careful about any kind of spoilers, but I do want to give you an idea what the book is about. So I did mention that um, it's most often framed as a social commentary of the Soviet era of the time, but I didn't read it in that light. I mean, it was a little hard to not see it, see the parallels there somewhat, but I think it's very relevant today because um, the experiences of many of the characters in the book are really, I think, still relevant today. But the main characters, well, let me set up what the doomed city is, what the city itself is. So the city is a city is set on one on the east, on one of the sides there is an abyss, an impossibly deep abyss, and on the other side is an impossibly high wall. To the south there are uh, like swamps that are mysterious and sort of dangerous, and then to the north there is an unknown. So what happened what has happened is the city is populated by people from Earth, but they're from different time periods. They're from different years from around the time of World War II all the way up into I believe the last one that's mentioned is from 1968. So like our main character Andre is from 1951. So they when they meet each other for the first time or when someone's new to the city, they will ask when they're from uh, because they're from all over the world. There are Americans, there are Russians, there are Swedish, there are Chinese, um, there are really people from all over the world. So the you you know we get this sense from the book um, that there are these people called mentors and we don't really know what the mentors are but they appear to kind of be over the city. The people themselves in the city think they're participating in something called the experiment. Um, so they don't really, they have no idea what the experiment is. They have no idea what they're doing there really. Um, so they're really all just trying to get by. The other kind of kind of interesting thing about this city that gives us sort of an idea that it's not quite on earth or at least it's not quite a city as we usually know it is that the city, the sun, gets turned on and off like an electric light bulb. It just comes on and then at at nighttime, I guess it just it goes off. Um, so you know it's not a it's not a uh, a standard sort of pattern, I guess that we would expect from our sun here on Earth. So either, but they appear to not be in an artificial environment. It does seem to be they are able to grow food and things like that. There's dirt and you know water, rain and stuff. So yeah, that's where we are. So the main characters, as I mentioned, Andre, then there's another, uh, the other main characters really are Selma, which is a, a, a woman that he meets. She's from, I don't remember what 
what year she's from, but she's from Sweden. And then another character, Wang. Um, and then Uncle Yura, who is kind of this sort of Soviet peasant kind of he uh, figure. He works out on a farm, and sometimes he comes into the city to sell his produce. And then um, his sort of, I guess, one other main character, his name is it's Itya Kotsman. Um, so, yeah, um, those are kind of the main characters. I don't want to, like I mentioned, give too much away about what happens in the book. I will say that the book starts out, we're in kind of what would be considered a communist system. People don't choose their occupations per se. They don't have a lot of individual freedom. As a matter of fact, um, there's shortages of goods always. Um, people live in sort of crowded conditions. Um, you know, their, uh, their apartments are assigned centrally, as are their jobs. And so it may be one, like, a uh, person might be a, you know, like a garbage collector in one case and then in the government in, you know, when it gets reassigned. So there's, there's not a lot of say so in your, in everyday life. Of course, the people there have a lot of ability to change governments, which, Ultimately, there is a, a political unrest within the within the city itself that I, I don't want to go into too much. Um, and then there's also, I mentioned, this unexplored area to the north. This actually plays quite an important part in the book eventually um, of an expedition to the north and what they, what they actually find there. Um, there is a rumored anti-city in the north. So there's the city and the anti-city. Some other mysterious things about the city. One thing about this city that happens to the, the people who live there is there's a lot of things that happen that they can't explain. And they don't even really try to explain. For example, I'll give a few examples. Just for example, about this wall. I mentioned on one side of the city there's this impossibly high wall. And then on the other side of the city there is this impossibly deep abyss. So this wall sometimes people fall from this wall no one knows where these people come from or how they would have gotten to the top um, of the wall um, so that is that is a mystery you know and like these kinds of things are not explained in the book another thing that happens right at the beginning of the book is the um, our main character Andre at this point is working as a garbage collector and he's out on his rounds in the morning and they notice that this just hundreds of baboons have started entering the city. And, you know, no one knows where these baboons came from or what purpose they serve or if it's part of the experiment or not, but they just sort of have to adapt to that constantly changing condition. And I think this is what made me think of it as relevant today because while we don't live in a Soviet system, I don't live in a Soviet-style system right now, I can still really relate to the book because in everyone's life, there's a certain degree of absurdity and there's a certain degree of sort of um, irrational things that happen to you that you have no control over um, because it's the culture around you, it's the government, you know, it's whatever it is that has made this decision or pushed uh, you in a certain direction that you have no control over and you just sort of have to adapt to it. Granted, I've never really seen baboons running wild in the streets, but um, that's sort of like to me a metaphor of, you know, every day something like that could happen to you where it makes no sense to you and somehow you just have to sort of get on with your day and continue collecting trash uh, in the case of our our main character Andre on that morning of the baboons so um, yeah so really I think you know ultimately Andre is trying to seek understanding um, I think Andre is our main character as I mentioned he is a complete devotee to the experiment so he's what one could consider if you're talking about the social commentary of the Soviet era he would be a, a, a really a um, you know a devout I guess communist uh, really devoted to the system, willing to suffer almost anything for the system. And so he, his character, while some of the other characters early on in the novel might grumble about the city and how it's run and the experiment, he thinks the experiment must be it, some glorious thing that he's taking part in. Even though he doesn't understand it, he assumes that it's some glorious cause. Um, and so he's sort of seeking understanding in that 
in that realm. My idea, there's a couple of other characters who seek a different kind of understanding in the book. One of them is Wang, who um, I mentioned earlier, who starts out in his, um, he's the caretaker of the building where Andre lives, and I think he, he really just doesn't want to be assigned, at one point he's going to get assigned to what would be considered a much higher status job, and he doesn't really want that because his happiness is actually, he at this point has a wife and a couple of kids, he really just wants to um, be home with his family and tend to his yard and um, sort of live this quiet um, sort of life with his with those that family that he loves. And then this character Isya, like I mentioned, um, Isya uh, Katzman, his friend uh, slash sometimes enemy, but uh, throughout the course of the book they do a lot of uh, have a lot of uh, interactions with each other in different ways, um, but. He has sort of this different view of um, really, I guess, a big cause, sort of a big picture where he doesn't try to find meaning in something like politics or anything like that. He or, you know, these sort of mundane everyday things um, to him, uh, humans do these sort of these sort of have these sort of follies that they establish governments and then tear them down and then have a different government and this kind of thing. Um, and it doesn't mean anything to him because he sees a bigger picture and I want to read a quote about this because what he's talking about is he talks about this temple this temple of knowledge that humanity builds for itself um, and drags around with it all the time and to him the important thing is is this temple uh, continues to get added to and so for I mentioned the expedition to the north or this unexplored area to the north you know Itya is one of the characters who's very interested in finding out what's the north in the north and just adding to the knowledge adding to knowledge and that's sort of his his thing but I wanted to read a quote from uh, the book about this temple uh, because I thought it was pretty cool so he says all the rest is just scaffolding around the wall of the temple he said all the best things that humankind had invented in a hundred thousand years all the important things it has understood and achieved through the power of thought go into that temple through all the millennia of its history, howling, starving, lapsing into slavery, and rebelling, guzzling, and copulating, humanity carries this temple along on the turbid crest of its wave without even suspecting it. Sometimes it suddenly notices this temple on its back and stumbles, and then it starts either taking the temple apart brick by brick, or frenziedly worshipping it, or building a different temple next to it in order to vilify it. But humankind never really understands what it's dealing with, and after it despairs of making use of the temple in some way or another, it's soon distracted by its own so-called vital needs. It starts dividing up all over again something that has already been divided up 33 times, crucifying somebody, glorifying somebody, but the temple just carries on growing and growing from century to century, from millennium to millennium, and it's impossible either to ultimately abase, to destroy it, or to ultimately abase it. So yeah, to him, see this uh, city and the experiment and all this absurdity and all this struggle that they go through in the city means nothing to him because to him, there's a temple being built for humanity um, and that's the only thing that ultimately matters. So I thought that was actually very cool. Um, all right, well, I'm about out of time. I don't know I did this book justice. I, I enjoyed it so much. It will not be the last of the Stragatsky Brothers novels that I read. There's been several new translations, and I think continue to be new translations of their works into English, and so I will continue reading reading on Stragatsky Brothers so there will be more of them to come. So my next book chat is going to be on Imaginary Cities by Darren Anderson. I have finished this book already, so I should have a book chat coming up on this very soon. It's all about the city in the imagination, like in literature, in art, and in the unbuilt plans of architects. There's a lot of them. So this book was really interesting for me, and I'll do a chat on this. I'll have a chat on this upcoming very soon. So stay tuned. Until next time, take care. Bye.